Um, so we're going to um, uh, hear from Matthew Goodman, um, comments on the three presentations, then we'll open it up for a bit of dialogue at the table and questions and answers with all of you. So please think of your questions. Thank you. Matt? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, hope everyone's refreshed and uh, ready to go the next round. Um, thanks to Jetro and um, um, for, for sponsoring this and, and Ishige-san for some uh, very interesting uh, remarks. And actually, I had to laugh when Urata-san used the same uh, chart as um, Ishige-san. I, I must say, Jetro charts are the best ever. I mean, I, that whenever my Jetro friends come to visit, you know, they give me always a package of charts and they've got great, you know, circles around different parts of the world and, and maps and arrows pointing and they're very helpful and uh, I, I, also, I also use them uh, um, in, in, uh, for myself. So um, I, I'm not going to make, uh, I'm not going to uh, say a lot. I'm just going to make a few, a few basic points and then, then I want to, you know, follow up and ha hear, uh, hear what the rest of the panel and the audience uh, think about all this. But, but let me just first say that just to remind folks that it's a point that um, Arata Sensei in particular made that, that, that what we're talking about here is, is ultimately about economic growth um, and the contribution that trade and uh, uh, integration can make to promoting economic growth and welfare. Um, I, I think actually Dr. Lim also said that, that from a Singapore point of view, these, this trade strategy is really about economics. It's not about um, non-economic factors in politics. Now, there is an element of that, and there certainly is for the United States, which I'll come back to, but I think fundamentally what we're talking here is enhancing economic growth and welfare. Um, and I think, again, Professor Rata did a good job of explaining why, uh, from a J Japanese perspective, um, you know, integrating through these uh, uh, trade uh, arrangements um, is, is critically important to Japan's economic growth prospects. Um, particularly when you look at that chart he showed on, on, uh, on demographics in Japan, which is truly uh, frightening. Um, um, I also wanted to make a sort of general chapeau point that, that we are talking, as Dr. Lim said, about a second best uh, set of um, approaches here because the best approach to trade liberalization is obviously a multilateral one. Um, and uh, I think everyone would be better off from an economic uh, welfare point of view if we could get a, a significant package of trade liberalization measures through the Doha round or some other multilateral uh, framework. Um, but since that doesn't seem to be something that is just humanly possible in the short term, uh, the regional trade arrangements and bilateral trade arrangements is the, is the second best and the, really the only way uh, to proceed and, you know, can generate uh, quite a lot of welfare and avoid a lot of the, the costs of, of the, of the uh, regional um, non-global dimension of, of these arrangements. And that's the sort of next point I want to make, which is that, you know, you really need to look at the economics of, of, of these um, arrangements and what the potential economic benefits are. And, and they're substantial. Um, uh, Professor um, Peter Petri of Brandeis did a, a study last fall um, with a couple of other professors about, um, about the potential gains, looking at the, the two sort of models that we've been looking here at here, TPP on the one hand, and a sort of an Asian track, um, which I think was the same uh, term that Professor Zhang used. Um, and, uh, they showed uh, that the, uh, the annual, well, the, the welfare gains in the short term are relatively limited, but the annual welfare gains by 2025, the annual, annual welfare gains to the world f f of a TPP uh, ar agreement uh, could be as high as $104 billion. Um, if you did a TPP agreement and an Asia track agreement, a CPO or an F e, uh, East Asia FTA or ASEAN plus plus or whatever um, uh, actual um, uh, terminology you use, that, that could amount to over $300 billion of annual welfare gains. And if we ultimately got to a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, um, the welfare gains could be as much as $862 billion per year. I mean, this is a, these are real numbers. Um, and um, if those are even off by, you know, an order of two or three, 
fold, they're still large numbers, and I think demonstrate that the trade creation effects of uh, either of these approaches and both of them together are, are substantial and, and overwhelm the trade diversion uh, impacts, which, um, which is what really that study showed, um, is that the, the, the trade diversion concerns that a lot of people have are, are actually probably uh, overstated. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, these two approaches that we're, we're talking about here are, 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 you know, seem to be broadly economically compatible and, and indeed um, uh, desirable uh, to pursue uh, both of these approaches. Obviously, there is a competitive element between them that's been touched on by all the panelists. Um, uh, but I think um, I think that competition is is probably a good thing, um, and I think that it, um, it 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 is ultimately aimed at the same outcome, which is a which is a a, a, a region wide free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Um, these are different sort of paths and different approaches, and they're they are in a bit of competition, but. Um, but they are ultimately um, aimed at the same outcome, which seems to be economically a, a very good thing for, for everyone involved. Um, so um, uh, I think I will just, um, I really just wanted to make those points, but I, I then wanted to just highlight or emphasize the point about um, uh, Japan and China, um, because they've, you know, we've, we've had presentations on each of those as, as well as on, on the ASEAN perspective. And clearly, um, again, uh, the benefits to Japan of joining TPP or, frankly, you know, any of these trade arrangements uh, are potentially substantial uh, and um, would, be, um, would be obviously beneficial for Japan. For the United States as well, it's clear that Jap Japanese entry, as, as um, Ishige-san mentioned, uh, Japanese entry would basically, from a U.S. perspective, would, would more than double the size of, of, uh, of TPP. And it's clearly in the U.S. Um, economic and strategic interest to have Japan part of TPP. Uh, you know, I also think that um, that uh, you know that it's important that Japan be ready to join and ready to join on terms that that uh, that the rest of the group uh, is is striving for. Um, inevitably, you know, if Japan were to join, um, there would be uh, it's a negotiation, so uh, there would be there would be compromises made and, and Japan would be able to preserve its position. But I think uh, Japan has to decide that it really wants to move forward and, and uh, take, the, uh, uh, take the steps necessary ultimately to, uh, to be a full participant. Um, similarly, I thought Professor Zhang's um, presentation about China was very interesting and, and I think he well laid out the pros and cons um, of, of Chinese entry. I thought on balance, at least I interpreted um, the pros as, as stronger than the cons. Um, and so I actually think Chinese, from a Chinese perspective, um, being in TPP uh, uh, looks like a, a net positive. Um, I do, on the other hand, think that, uh, that it's uh, what he said about China's approach and, and uh, the wait and see approach uh, also makes sense. I mean, I think maybe, maybe uh, entering at this moment is not either feasible or desirable from a Chinese perspective. Um, I do think ultimately, again, for the United States, uh, it will ultimately be not only better, I mean, it's essential to have China as part of a region-wide uh, trade arrangement. And um, I think it's only a question of timing and tactics and, and, um, and uh, you know, how you get there that is, I think, the issue. It's not a question of whether it's ultimately desirable. Um, I was going to make one other point, but I think I'll stop there because I want to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank Let me ask one question or set of questions to the table before opening it up. There's an obvious tension uh, that has emerged in all the presentations between uh, quality and quantity, between the um, depth of liberalization and the coverage of com member countries. Uh, most of our speakers, uh, uh, in one way or another, suggested the U.S. should consider giving a little on quality in order to get quantity. So I want to pursue that with some of our pres presenters, and beginning with um, Mr. Goodman. So, um, you know, the President doesn't have trade promotion authority to do TPP. And my sense is the expectation on the Hill is that when he does get that trade promotion authority, it's going to set a standard that is at least 
uh, chorus. Um, and it's going to be chorus plus. It's going to be expectation. So that's not going to check the box or satisfy those in the region who are saying we need to be a little bit mushier and lower the quality a bit to be more inclusive. Can you imagine scenarios over the next 5, 10, 15 years, having worked on this, where the U.S. might be you know, either in inspired or uh, worried or uh, coaxed into uh, uh, loosening that? Um, and we won't hold you accountable for this in future confirmation hearings. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm not going to answer your questions if you call me Mr. Goodman again. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's a negotiation. Uh, it's a negotiation among the parties in the TPP. It's implicitly a negotiation with parties not in the TPP. And it's a negotiation, ultimately, it will be with the Hill. I mean, there's some things the Hill sort of statutorily requires, but most of it, I think, is subject to negotiation. And it'll be a a question of um, the package of benefits that the administration is able to sell. And, you know, that is an argument for having, um, and I think it's an argument that Fred Bergson's made in terms of having more participants in, that, you know, the more you have the Japans and the bigger economies in, the more potential gains there are for the United States um, that can be shown to Congress um, as, as a reason to support the thing. But inevitably, you know, we're not going to get everything we want, and, and it's going to, I mean, the quality is going to be not as good as the perfect um, high standard that, that, uh, that I think the administration is rightly, you know, still holding the line on or trying to hold the line on because it's, it's easy to give, you know, to, to fall back. Um, it's much less easy to, I think, build up. And that's one of the reasons that sort of in terms of the approaches uh, between these two sort of models that I think the TPP model, um, you know, has appeal to me because it feels like it's better to start high in your ambition with a smaller group that you can potentially achieve something close to, if not, you know, at that level, um, and then try to uh, bring others in. And as you bring others in, inevitably, I don't think it's going to be set in stone. You know, again, I said that for Japan's sake because I think there will be some scope for Japan to to, uh, to shape even the core text, my guess is, in reality. Um, and, I mean, not if, it's, not if it's a done deal and five years from now Japan joins, you know, it would be more like an accession, but if it's still sort of a fluid process. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, I think, I think you can get pretty close to a high-level agreement um, and expand it out to a broader grouping, um, and that would, uh, that would, I mean, I'd like to see the economics a little more carefully to see whether that, uh, but my instinct is that that would produce a better economic result than uh, than a sort of lower standard agreement with a lot of people in that could get done more quickly. And I look forward to working with you, Senator, to blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, so one way uh, over the 5, 10, 15-year time horizon you could see this going is, as Ishige-san pointed out, U.S. and Japan are 90 percent or so compatible uh, or in agreement on the, the, the core substance. That would certainly be true for Korea, for Canada, for Mexico, for Australia. So um, I, for my, speaking for myself, could imagine a scenario where this becomes a kind of an Asia-Pacific OECD agreement. And, and, and yes, Vietnam, Malaysia, others are interested or involved, but it could start proceeding with both high quality and quantity because it might be fairly easy for some of these, relatively easier for some of these more developed economies to lock in. I wonder if it came to that, Professor Zhang or Urata-san or Professor Lim, wh what would that do to the dynamics within Asia? Do you think it would spur uh, per per countries to participate more or, or, or create a kind of a divide between developed and developing trade liberalization patterns? You know, it took uh, 15 years for China uh, pre uh, prior to the uh, December 2001 uh, accession to the WTO. Uh, uh, so the uh, this is the uh, the problem. Uh, like now, uh, <clears throat> Malaysia, uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, uh, also now in negotiation with TPP. So. Um, of course, they, bilaterally, the United States are conducting uh, as well as with Japan on a, a pre uh, pre uh, joining the TPP. So, um, uh, but how are they going to uh, to to exit? You know, or, or maybe the uh, 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 you know the uh, different time uh, time schedule for Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia not too much a problem, but I think it's Vietnam. 
is uh, Pr Prime Minister Nguyen Phan Dong, when he was in Singapore in November 2009, announced it. It surprised to many of even his ministers, uh, uh, not to his senior officials, because Vietnam would not be possible. Okay, uh, I can see the position of the United States that quality is very important, and then from there on. But because of the diversities of the TPP uh, uh, interest uh, uh, negotiators, and this is how to work it out, you know, in such a way. In the, uh, in the WTO, you have that uh, a long track, long haul. So it means you are on the taxi on the runway before you get into a full membership. So would that be possible in the TPP? So that sort of thing need to be, uh, to be uh, uh, worked out, you know. Uh. Professor Rata, did you want to? Uh, I, uh, I agree with what uh, Dr. Lim just said. Uh, you know, special and differential treatment. Maybe U.S. doesn't like that expression, uh, but that, that's a fact of life. I mean, there are differences in level of economic development. Some countries can. Uh, uh, join uh, a very high level uh, uh, framework, you know, you know, this OECD type maybe. But for developing countries, they are eager to join, but uh, they like to have more time, and uh, we should really allow them to have more time. And, but uh, as long as a you know, goal is set, and there's, a, 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 I guess, a procedure and process or stages which are clearly uh, uh, indicated, I think that should be okay to, to join. So I agree with what Dr. Lin just said. Yes. Um, you know, just uh, uh, as I uh, discussed in my pre presentation that, uh, you know, uh, uh, OECD type, uh, uh, you know, high uh, level uh, agreement, uh, trade agreement, uh, for the time being, you know, China cannot cannot meet the requirements of that. So uh, uh, in, the long, in the long run, China will be part of that uh, uh, process. Uh, beyond, beyond the economic, uh, uh, economic consideration, there are some, some Chinese uh, uh, scholars who are very skeptical uh, about the, the, the real intention of, uh, of the TPP here in this region. Uh, so some Chinese think it uh, can be or might be used as a, as a tool to block China's rise. So so between China and uh, you know TPP, there there are a lot of uh, you know obstacles to 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 be removed. Uh, uh, you know trust, mutual trust is is fundamental for for the building up of trade. Uh, uh, agreement. Can, can I just um, jump in? I, that is I, an, um, a, a perception in, in China that I've heard as well, that there is a, um, an intention here by the United States to, to block China's rise or to somehow con use the TPP to contain China. I, I just fundamentally don't believe that, and I'm not <laughs> sure why the Chinese think that, because um, TPP is clearly designed to do the opposite, which is to pull China and everyone else in the region. I mean, that's explicitly its, its objective as a pathway to an FTAP, of which China is a member. I mean, China is a member of APEC, and a FTAP is, <coughs> is an APEC initiative um, that all the APEC members have signed on to. Um, and uh, so the, the, the goal is actually to bring China in, um, yes, on high standard terms, which will will constrain their behavior just as our behavior is con will be constrained if we are if we are part of that group so it's it's analogous i think to the wto um, process in that the the idea was to bring uh, china and you know other new members russia now um, into the agreement to uh, to force domestic change and this is why china wanted to be in um, and, and but to subject it to the international rules that, that everyone else is subjected to for mutual benefit. And, and we certainly paid a price in, in the sense of, of being constrained post our WTO, the, the creation of even the United States moving from GATT to WTO, 
was more constrained, is more constrained than it was before. Section 301 that we used to use against uh, Japan, um, as uh, Jim McDermott mentioned in the good old days, um, we can't use anymore because of the WTO. It constrains us. And, and yes, that is the objective vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, so there should be no illusions about that. It's, it is a constrainment policy, but it's not containment. It's not designed to block China's entry or to block mm -hmm. their rise. To answer my own question briefly, uh, there would I could I could see a scenario where there would be attraction for an OECD high-end kind of you know existing free trade partners coming together. But the fastest-growing economies are not OECD countries right now, so there would be a serious discussion people would have to have in Washington about whether we want to risk decoupling trade liberalization from from what you just described with um, with the with the fastest-growing economies. Okay, uh, we have some time for questions from the audience. If you could, we have microphones. If you could identify yourself and um, uh, questions are preferred to speeches. Um, and uh, sorry, it's a not not a big enough finger. I can't see it. <laughs> oh. I'm uh, Larry Nix from C uh, CSIS. I'd like to ask uh, the panelists, uh, especially uh, Professor uh, Urata, with regard to uh, attitudes in Japan, is there any effect on political attitudes or even attitudes within governments as to how far to go into integrative regional organizations coming out of what is happening in Europe now? and the growing apparent likelihood of a worst case scenario with regard to European integration. Uh, Greece uh, abandoning the euro, uh, Greece and perhaps several other countries defaulting on their debts, uh, going back to their own currencies, which I believe would lead to the establishment of trade barriers, at least in those countries, if you get what increasingly seems likely a worst case scenario now with regard to European integ economic integration, what kind of fallout is this going to have on opinions in Japan, for example, on how far to go into an organization like the TPP, or for that matter in China, uh, about how to approach these kinds of proposals in Asia, and whether there are limits as to how far uh, individual countries should go into integrative arrangements. Okay, um, thank you very much for a very uh, good question. Uh, this is my view, uh, and maybe uh, Hank Lim and others can maybe uh, make your own statement later. Uh, this, uh, you know, Euro kind of experiment, uh, maybe it's not an experiment anymore, this is a fact. Uh, uh, and monetary cooperation, currency cooperation, uh, and, and that is a, a step uh, which is far, you know, beyond the horizon of what is happening in East Asia. East Asia, as you know, uh, I have a Chenma initiative. This is the, uh, 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 currency, uh, uh, foreign reserves uh, 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 kind of pool. Uh, it's like, uh, I guess, IMF to some extent. Uh, but that's as far as uh, East Asia decided to go. And maybe beyond that, uh, they used to talk about the common currency. But now that uh, uh, they see what is happening in Europe, one, I guess, one important reason behind what is happening in Europe is that they are common currency. There are some, well, uh, cent one central bank, but there is no coordination or cooperation in fiscal uh, area. So, uh, uh, and that is uh, one of the reasons why they are having a problem. Uh, so, um, uh, East Asian countries uh, have decided to increase the uh, amount of Chenma initiative, multilateralized one. Uh, but that, again, like I said, that is what decided to go as far as they, they like to go. They are not really thinking about currency, common currency, because uh, they just observe what happened in Europe. So that is the impact, if I may say, of the uh, uh, current uh, European economic turmoil 
on the uh, policy formulation or regional policy formulation in East Asia. Thank you. You know, the uh, Asian Development Bank, uh, uh, sorry, um, the, uh, there's an AMRO, uh, the ASEAN Plus 3 uh, Macroeconomic uh, uh, Research uh, uh, Office in Singapore, opened on the 1st of May last year. Um, so this is the uh, internal, internalizations of the Chiang Mai initiatives. So the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, uh, t last week uh, uh, in their uh, annual meeting in Manila has agreed to increase the uh, swap, uh, the uh, reserve of the, uh, in case there is any financial crisis from 120 billion to 240 billion. So double it up. Now the purpose of AMRO is not for um, um, others than specifically is the part of when ASEAN financial crisis in 1997 for surveillance. So macroeconomics uh, uh, among all the uh, ASEAN 10 plus uh, China, in uh, uh, Korea, and Japan to have an uh, exchange of information on the macroeconomics on the issues of, of uh, in case of impending problems. The second point is the uh, currency swap in case there is a, a shortage of certain uh, currency that the others are uh, using that 240 billion. The third element, the one that the AMRO in Singapore is based, is the um, uh, issues of the, um, uh, which now uh, increasingly China wants not to internalize internationalizations of the yuan, J uh, Chinese yuan, but it's a, a sort of uh, butter paying it. It has done already with uh, Indonesia, with Thailand, and with uh, Philipp uh, with uh, Korea also. And increasingly, that is a sort of a pre uh, uh, precedence towards the internal internalizations and the payments of trade uh, settlements uh, in, in Chinese yuan. So <clears throat> the purpose is specifically within that Chiang Mai initiative, interna internationalizations uh, activities. It could be some would uh, interpret that this is the, uh, the, pre uh, the prelude for the emergence of the uh, Asian Monetary Fund. It can be. It depends, uh, uh, but it's a long way for, uh, uh, away from what is the original intentions of the Chiang Mai Initiative internationalization programs, as uh, Professor Urata indicated. Correct. Thank you. Can, can I just add, I mean, I think that the, the situation in Europe is, is extremely serious and extremely, you know, frankly, scary. Um, uh, and, and maybe a lesson for East Asia about the hazards of currency union, particularly without, you know, full fiscal uh, union and the sovereignty implications of that, which I think we're a long way from in Asia. Um, but it does not, it, it should not send a chilling message to the uh, rationale for trade and investment integration in the region, which I think, you know, is, uh, not what's at stake in Europe uh, right now, and that should not be, uh, it just should not discourage that, that type of integration really in any way. In fact, I, and in fact, I don't think it is um, uh, on the trade side, but it is a reminder of the moral hazard problem for big economies when you start moving currency coordination closer together. Other questions? Sir. You stand up so our mic. Matthew, I, I like the uh, the word constrainment. I think that uh, was worth the price of admission today just to take that, that word out of here. So we'll definitely give you credit for that. Um, kind of staying with this currency theme, uh, one of the things that, that I didn't hear throughout the presentations, and I think they were all very fact-based and, and, and very poignant and uh, talking about where the current issues are and, and, and where uh, there's gaps, but there was really no mention of currency disciplines because despite the high standard that one is trying to achieve within the TPP negotiations, any trade agreement could be rendered ineffective uh, if uh, participating countries are allowed to intervene in their currencies and render those uh, statutes uh, essentially moot if, if industries aren't allowed to restructure. So just wanted to talk to you, every time we bring up currency, it seems to be a bridge too far in trade negotiations. 
and what your thoughts are on that, and, and will we ever get to a point where we can talk about currency disciplines within trade negotiations? Matt, you're not in the State Department anymore. So you're not in the State Department anymore. You're allowed to talk about currency. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it's true that, uh, you know, uh, currency or, or monetary cooperation uh, is a missing part of a, a TPP or FTA agreement in the Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific nego negotiations. Um, yeah, I think dollar, the U.S. dollar is uh, is play, playing a, a key key role in uh, in you know in the functions of uh, you know invoicing uh, settlement and uh, uh, foreign exchange reserve. So, but the, now China is on the way to uh, international lie lies. Like the internationalization of its uh, uh, currency, uh, we we are expanding the the, the use uh, of uh, Chinese yuan, and uh, uh, we uh, set up set up you know uh, offshore offshore market of Chinese uh, 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 Chinese uh, currencies uh, you know transactions. Either in in Hong Kong and uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, but uh, I, I think the internationalization of a Chinese currency is, uh, you know, it's a long story. We we, we cannot uh, you know, expect uh, uh, within uh, five or ten years the Ch Chinese yuan will will uh, will be used as a key currency in this area. Uh, we also discussed, uh, you know, the, the failure of uh, uh, internet internationalization of Japanese yen. It's uh, maybe you you you, you do not, you know, Professor uh, Ulada, do not agree with me. Uh, I use the term your failure, failure of internationalization of yen. Um, the the European, you know, crisis. Uh, 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 is teaching us a lesson that uh, that uh, the cooperation, cooperation among uh, among among the nations uh, uh, in Asia Pacific uh, in uh, in monetary uh, uh, in terms of monetary uh, or uh, currency, uh, it it's, it it will be very difficult uh, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, years ago, people people are, uh, were interested in in doing that, but now you know, they they gradually they give up that that idea. So, so maybe I think one of the result is uh, the, the dollar dollars uh, you know leading role in in, in uh, this area. Murata Sensei, do you want to touch on this? Japan has exchange rate competitiveness issues with. Well, people are buying yen now, so <laughs> in one sense you succeeded, but, but, but also in any discussions with Japan, excuse me, China and Korea, exchange rate competitiveness questions are pretty serious for Japanese industry. Well, well Japan has been saying that, uh, again, Chinese yuan should be appreciated uh, or it's undervalued uh, uh, because of uh, uh, restrictions and regulations that uh, the Chinese government is imposing uh, that uh, situation, undervalued uh, yuan has been there for many years. Uh, but I, I, I guess uh, they are making pro efforts to internationalize uh, Chinese yuan. Uh, the, I don't know whether it's a right speed or maybe too slow, but they are uh, making effort. Uh, just one point on this, uh, your point about failure <laughs> of uh, internationalization of yuan. Yen, I'm sorry, yen, not the yuan. Uh, <laughs> uh, J Japan wanted to uh, increase its uh, influence in currency market uh, by uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, yen has been, it will be held in, uh, as an asset, an international asset, and the rate, you know, the proportion of that may increase, and that's the internationalization of yen. But uh, uh, Japan failed because uh, uh, ministry in charge of uh, uh, these activities, Minister of Finance, has been quite reluctant in opening up 
or, or getting rid of these restrictions. And uh, uh, investors don't want to hold assets in a currency which is being regulated. So, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, uh, I mean, very difficult uh, for a country to give up uh, this kind of regulation. And I know China is facing the same problem. Yes. Uh, so again, uh, that may be a failure, but uh, failure, the reason for failure is very clear. The uh, Japanese uh, or Minister of Finance didn't want to get rid of some of the uh, power they had. And so this is a trade-off. If you want to make your currency internationalized or, or becoming a very international currency, you have to give up something. And w the question is whether China is ready to give up uh, 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 some of the, you know, maybe stability uh, of the uh, exchange rate uh, uh, by having restrictions. Uh, so that's, I think that's the issue. I want to ask the audience a question, if you'll indulge me. Um, yeah. It'll be a it'll be a hand raising answer. So on this issue of trust, um, and this is a unique audience and not representative of this town or the nation as a whole necessarily. But the question I wanted to ask is, uh, how many people in the room think that the goal uh, for the U.S. should be for China to eventually accede to TPP? And if you agree, then put your hand up. Interesting. That's a lot fewer than I would have expected, to be honest. Um, the question was should, not will. Um, let me ask another question, um, which is about this um, CJK, China, Japan, Korea trilateral summit uh, held last weekend. And in that summit, as you heard from previous speakers, uh, China, Japan, and Korea agreed to start negotiations on a trilateral FTA. So I want to ask just the Americans in the audience, only Americans get to vote on this one, sorry. Um, uh, and the question is, is whether this is a potential uh, problem for the US or whether it's virtuous. And so I'll, I'll, I guess the way I'll ask is it, it, for people to put their hand if they think that this uh, China, Japan, Korea free trade agreement is potentially uh, trade diverting or strategically or in other ways potentially a problem for the US. So of the Americans in the audience willing to raise their hands or not, uh, who, does anyone think this trilateral is potentially problematic for US interests? Uh, not problematic among the Americans? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So roughly 60, 40, 50, 50? Not, not problematic. <laughs> Are you American? <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. I have to be honest, that's not what I expected for a conference on international trade. There's, there's, there's at least in this unscientific survey, there's a bit of skepticism uh, about whether China should eventually exceed. And if we had done this, if I'd done this in a um, congressional hearing, my guess is that a maybe a majority of members of Congress would have expressed skepticism. Uh, so that's interesting. And then on, on the China, Korea, Japan uh, trilateral, there is some, uh, some concern, clearly, uh, that it could be uh, uh, a problem. Of course, the answer for us is to do TPP. I'll answer that one for you. <clears throat> All right, um, I'll take one more question, and then we'll do lunch, if anyone has one, or if you want to explain your vote. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Jay Park, uh, visiting fellow at the CSIS. A very quick question, the relation between China and Japan. Uh, ASEAN plus three EAFTA and ASEAN plus uh, six uh, CPA, those two ideas have been, uh, let me say, evolved into a new concept of RCEP last year. And uh, the, uh, the last year, August, a uh, joint proposal by China and Japan, I think, helped to evolve into that uh, direction. I just wonder uh, whether the uh, Chinese preference for ASEAN plus 3 EAFTA and Japanese preference for CEPIA finally concluded, or uh, China still does have the position of sequential approach, which means uh, EAFTA, ASEAN plus 3 first, and then ASEAN plus 3, 6, and beyond. Thank you. Sorry, uh, your, que I th your question to China was very clear. Uh, whether you know they had a EFTA and CPA, but uh, what was the question? Did you have a question to me or no? Sorry, uh, I couldn't really hear. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. ASEAN, uh, as I mentioned it at the last uh, paragraph, the uh, reinforced by the Jakarta framework, which uh, was uh, initiated by Indonesia in uh, at the uh, Bali uh, Concord Tree, they call it, uh, in uh, November 2011. Uh, <clears throat> equal distance. Okay, so uh, ASEAN <clears throat> does not take any position. Uh, as long as uh, the centrality, the hub, uh, of the East Asia economic integration remains ASEAN as the main pillar. Okay. So with respect to uh, EFTA, East Asia, FTA uh, strongly supported, has been with, with China and CPR uh, supported by Japan. ASEAN position is very clear. It's uh, even uh, um, n no taking side. It's, uh, as long as ASEAN is the central of the in economic integration. Secondly, also the ASEAN position is very clear uh, with respect to the, uh, um, uh, in fact, actually the um, FTA, the, uh, uh, within the Chiang Mai initiative, the AMRO, uh, because the East Asia FTAs uh, does not contain on the financial aspects of it as was uh, raised the question. That's why the, um, I, I and Nisimura San, the executive director of the area, uh, two weeks ago went to see uh, Mr. Nemoto, the uh, incoming uh, director of the AMRO in Singapore at the MAS Central Bank. And uh, in fact, actually now at this point in time, they are very uh, uh, busy uh, uh, monitoring the uh, uh, performance of the macroeconomic performance of all the uh, 10 ASEAN countries plus <laughs> Japan, China, and and uh, and um, uh, and Korea. So, <coughs> on the other side, also on the CPR, the uh, working groups on the uh, trade facilitations, on the custom harmonizations and uh, economic corporations, customs and stand standardization, all this. In fact, actually, is uh, uh, from the study group of the CPR, ASEAN also su supported strongly. So it means that even equal distance. With, uh, with respects to all this CPR and EP, uh, EPA. And ASEAN welcomed very strongly the uh, announcement by Japan and China in August last year of this uh, set, uh, setting up of these uh, working groups. So that's the... Uh, may I, I just take opportunity of these things? So this one is very important on the TPP that uh, uh, I was in China also in uh, November uh, on... Um, uh, a state planning uh, actually organized by the China National Committee for PAC on the TPP. It's a widespread perception that the TPP uh, 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 is an instrument of US policy to suppress China's suppression. That's why I think this is not correct. Uh, whether it is true or not, but it is a lack of publicity in, in the United States for various reasons. One of it is that the bilaterals, like for example, the U.S. and uh, Japan, and the U.S. Uh, with uh, Vietnam and with uh, with Malaysia, secret, nobody knows. So it should be more open, more transparent. So therefore, the dealings is not on a bilateral basis, just like in the in the WTO. So therefore, as a result of it, create create apprehension in China. Uh, um, and Indonesia, in fact, actually, uh, I was informed by some uh, analysts in Indonesia uh, and at the, at the ASEAN Secretariat, also, uh, I think they advise it. The United States should be more transparent in, 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 tr in uh, um, getting the message across that uh, because the United States also is not a, a monotone in one single voice that uh, uh, in, in its relations with China. That's why I am very, very uh, pleased to hear that uh, uh, the, represented, uh, the representative McDermott mentioned it, you know, that uh, war with China and all this is inevitable or is something of a way of uh, ordinary, but it, it can be avoided. In fact, actually, the more you think it is an adversary, the, the, it's self-fulfilling. Therefore, as a result of it, a more uh, public relations and uh, transparent policy with the United States to see that TPP is, in fact, actually is used to bring China out and to constrain it along the line as the multilateral WTO. But unfortunately, that is a widespread perception in China. 
you know. So that's. Uh, I would like to get across that message. I'm going to ask uh, uh, finally, um, uh, Professor Lim, a Machiavellian question, <laughs> um, uh, and give you a chance to respond. ASEAN centrality in the context of the East Asia Summit or the ASEAN Regional Forum has some um, uh, power now. Um, because in those geostrategic or security or political settings, neither China nor the US nor Japan uh, wants to lose influence. And, and the ASEAN member states have an ability, over the last year or two they've shown this, in the ASEAN Regional Forum East Asia Summit, to impose a cost on China or the US or other major powers if they stray too far. And so, so ASEAN and Singapore in particular have been successful at shoehorning the big powers into the East Asia Summit and making them participate because the geostrategic competition means that if ASEAN leans one way or the other, there's a, there's a, there's a cost to China or the US. It's kind of influence cost. But on the trade side, uh, I don't understand, to be very Machiavellian, why, uh, I understand why Singapore and member states would want ASEAN centrality on trade architecture. But from the perspective of the US or China or Japan or the major powers, can you explain to me, and I forgive me for being a realist, but why should we feel the same uh, pressure to have an ASEAN-centered uh, trade framework when Japan and China and all the powers are quite capable of negotiating trade agreements unlike security agreements? I'm not sure what the leverage uh, ASEAN brings to the trade architecture to insist on an ASEAN. Of course, Singapore and other member states are involved in TPP. There's ASEAN China. But what, what's the source of the leverage on the trade side for ASEAN? Well, they, <clears throat> there is no le leverage. This is uh, very unprecedented in uh, human history, you know, that the weakest holds the trump card. So in the sense of the big power, China, Japan, the United States all now, all part of the East Asia Summit, uh, you know, uh, in Bali, uh, November. So ASEAN has that uh, uh, leverage on that point. But on economic side, uh, uh, it doesn't have it. So therefore, uh, um, as, uh, um, uh, ASEAN also is very apprehensive about, about the CJK, China, Japan, Korea, uh, 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 trilateral FTA, because it may loosen. Uh, because you see among in the East Asia, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, Japan, China, and Korea holds almost 90% of all trades and uh, investments. So ASEAN is only about maximum 10%. So it doesn't have the leverage to it, you know. How far it can go, I personally not very sure it will be uh, sustainable over a long period of time. Even a short period of time, if it doesn't uh, complete the uh, ASEAN economic community by 2015, which is almost analysts agree, it will not be 100%. So uh, uh, maximum about 85%. So uh, between 75 to 85%. That also, in a way, weaken ASEAN's uh, uh, economic uh, uh, leverage on it. So I agree with you. It means ASEAN doesn't have that, and they know it. The very moment as CJK comes into uh, the horizon, ASEAN becomes very nervous on, about it. Um, and I should hasten to add that I. I, I think, and most of us who work on this, Ernie Bauer, our Southeast Asia expert, think we need to be the U.S. investing much more in our um, engagement with ASEAN and, and overall diplomatic relations. And I appreciate your realist answer. And sometimes for U.S.-China trust, we need to do some ASEAN bashing, just, 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 just so we have something. All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you to the panel. We'll have lunch and, and, and resume shortly. Thank you.